I'd like to speak a little bit more about the art of visualization. So visualization is a method of reading energy or getting some more information about something. And in visualization everything is a symbol. So what you see is not necessarily what you see if you see a spider or a wolf or a bear or a dragon. It doesn't mean that there is necessarily a spider, a wolf, a bear or a dragon. It just means that there is something there and your mind is associating it with some creature or some form or some color. So it is an associative process. And this also creates some confusion if several people are, in a way, all looking at the same situation they can have a very different reading of the situation. So the essence will be identical, but the experience will be quite different. So, for instance, if I'm looking at a blockage, for me it can look like, gosh, there's this big heavy stone lying on the chakra. For another person, maybe like, oh, there's this black slime covering the chakra. And other people may say, oh, I see this little demon there who's holding down the chakra. And that depends very much on the person's own associative processes. All that exists is the energy. But we cannot perceive the energy directly, so we need to visualize. And building up a visualization uh, is an art. And the better you get at it, the more you get used to doing it, uh, the better you will be at reading it. So often the first visualizations can be quite confusing because you are not used to the symbolic language yet. Another problem which can happen is that you are in a way half missing the target. So there's an energy here, we're down here, we're trying to look up and we build up an image and the image is like kind of connected to it but not fully. So you are missing a large part of the picture and you're inventing another large part of the picture. But because there is some similarity, you think you have the whole truth, the entirety of it. And so these are some of the more dangerous misconceptions which can happen. And the best way to prevent these misconceptions is, first of all, be clear. And what does I mean that you should be free of any hope and also free of any fear. The less judgments you have, the less you will project or expect. So if you go into something completely blank, you're also not blocking anything from showing itself, from manifesting itself. But at the moment that you have a fear, then you're not really willing to open up, you're not willing to see everything. In the same way if you're having a hope, you're not willing to see everything. And then you're in a way already cutting off part of the cosmos and telling it not to reveal itself. Or, on the opposite, that is the only part you will see. Because your own fear or your own hope will guide you there or will pull you into that part of the cosmos where you can see the thing you want to see, or which is inside of you. So, neutrality is essential. And this also makes it very hard to visualize yourself or your loved ones. The closer you get to them, the worse your reading will be. So, this is a little bit of a tricky problem if you're trying to help yourself. And it can be very useful, even though you can be a great healer, to see a colleague when the matters become very personal. The other thing is, of course, that you can skew what you see because of your own hopes and fears but also the client you're working for can do the same because out of their mind out of their emotions out of their memories they also create energetic futures energetic images which a sensitive person can pick up so if a person is afraid uh, for a certain thing to happen to them then and they have a strong energy body with a good connection to the higher world, then they will create their worst fear in the astral. 
And if I look, yes, it exists. It is there. The thing you are afraid of is existing. But maybe it's only existing because the person is afraid of it. Or maybe what they hope for is existing because they hope for it. So if the person you are working with has such a strong desire or such a strong fear, then also the quality of the reading will be a lot less. Ideally, you would want your client to be completely neutral, to accept whatever there exists. But usually if a person is completely neutral, is completely uh, at peace with whatever will uh, exist and what future there will be, then usually they're not looking for help, they're not looking for aid, they're not looking for comfort. They won't go to a person who can perform a reading for them. So this is always a tricky thing. So the client on the one hand wants a reading, but on the other hand they're preventing you from creating a good reading. What you can try to do is to make your client feel supported, feel more at ease and let them know that everything is okay. And usually when the client calms down more and goes also more into a meditative accepting state, then also they will put less energy into their fears or into their hopes. So then the quality of the reading can improve. Um, it's also true that the brain stores patterns. So if you've been doing a lot of readings or you have been worrying a lot yourself or you have been hoping a lot yourself or you're in some kind of a pattern in your own brain, then also that is what you will see. Not so much because of the energy, but basically because it is easy to see. Once you've trodden a certain path a lot within the brain, that path becomes very easily accessible. It becomes your default route. Like, what will I see? What will I do? Well, just do the same thing. This is why it is important also for a healer to take a break once in a while. To take a few minutes between sessions to meditate, to let go of all the impressions of the previous session before they go into the next one. So once you've worked with all the precautions, you can try to do the reading yourself. And here it is usually best to try to build it up as slowly and as solidly as possible. A little bit like in a movie when something is out of focus and slowly it starts to become more clear, it starts to reveal itself. Um, this requires some patience, because if you start poking and looking for something, then that is what you will see. Uh, because everything exists in the universe. The most remote futures already exist within the world of energy. And if you look for something, then you will definitely find it. So expecting something and looking for it, or looking very specifically for something, will show you that thing. But looking in a way um, with your sensitivity. It's a little bit like being in a dark room with a flashlight. You can see that corner of the room or that corner of the room or the wall in front of you or the wall to the side of you, but you cannot see the whole of it in one glance. And this is the problem with energetic perception, that you have to focus yourself. You need, you're having this almost laser ray which you're projecting towards the things you're looking for and thereby you're excluding the rest of the energetic universe. If you're more relaxed and open then usually the things which are strongest will reveal themselves first and the more subtle impressions, the more details will appear later. So first you get a rough image and then the details are filling themselves in naturally. This is the best way, so you need some patience for the truth to reveal itself. If you push it, then it will just get away from you, or you will fill it in with your own mind, with your own projections. What I like to do is also to work a little bit with uh, testing the, um, uh, the imagery. So. Imagery has a lot of different vibrations. There's the sight of it, there's the sound of it, there's the smell of it, the taste, the feel of it. And 
Usually the more senses an image can encompass, the more sure you can be that it exists on many levels, that it is actually a truth you're finding, not just an illusion you're finding. And for me, usually the, thing, the way things show themselves first is visually. So I tend to see something. And if I'm feeling in a very accepting mood, that is enough. And if I'm having doubts, is this real? Is this true? Well, then I try to also feel the energy, to smell the energy, to taste the energy, to hear the sound, the vibration of the energy. And if all are in a way in correspondence with each other, then in a way you have a whole object, a whole thing. And it exists on all the different levels of vibration. So then it is probably something which exists because it exists on all these levels. And if you find that you can visualize something but you cannot hear it, you cannot feel it, it has no warmth to it, it has no substance to it, then usually it is just an imagination. It's a projection, either of yourself, or from the client, or from somebody else. And these false images, they can also become true. Because higher energies, in a way, coalesce and become a physical reality. But there are myriad of energies and only one physical reality. And out of this myriad of possibilities, only the strongest ones will manifest themselves into existence. And what you're seeing is not wrong. It is an energetic reality. So you should not doubt yourself, like, am I really seeing this? Yes, you are really seeing this. The thing you should be asking yourself is, like, how likely is this reality to be the dominant reality? And also, if it is the dominant reality, but I don't like it, what can I do to make another reality the dominant reality. Because the future is not set in stone and energies can be manipulated, they can be changed by using your willpower. And this is very tricky because if you use too much willpower you're just creating an image, you're projecting it and you have this illusion and in this illusion everything is fine. There's not a problem, there's not, nothing to worry about. And you can see this illusion very clearly with your own eyes. You can feel it, you can smell it, you can feel the strength of it. But it is ultimately something which is created by you and not necessarily something which is connected to the person. And if you want to work with the imagery and your power, then you need to do it in a very gentle way, so you do not sever the connection between the image and the source of the image. So if I look at the person's chakra, and the chakra manifests itself as a lotus, then I cannot just say like, okay, this lotus is looking all wrong, it needs more petals and blah 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 blah, and force a different image on it and then hope that the client is also cured. No, I'm just creating my own image, which is separate from the client. What you want to do is to more or less nurture the image you're having and keeping the connection with the client whole and then slowly altering that image. And by your will you can add energy to it, you can add life force to it so it can start to change, it can start to grow. And through the connection the chakra it is connected to will also start to grow, will start to move in the same way. It's very similar to reflexology where you grab a person's hand or ear or foot and you push on certain spots of the foot. And by stimulating that part of the foot, also the organ moves along with it and gets stimulated because the two are connected. The foot is not the organ. The organ is not the foot but they influence each other. They're connected through a line of energy. And it is the same with imagination and visualization. You can imagine something and then it is connected to you. If you visualize something, you try to see the essence of it. And the essence is connected to the source of that essence. 
you can help to start a visualization with an imagination. So I can, for instance, say like, okay, I will use a flower as a symbol. And I think of a flower. And then I allow that flower to metamorphose, to really become the kind of flower that the chakra is. And then you're in a way just kickstarting the visualization using your imagination. And this is fine. I do that lots of times. But you also need to know when to let go. You can start something off and then you have to allow the images to be. And then sometimes images are not clear. What does it mean? And you can talk about it with your client, like I see this. And maybe the imagery is not your imagery. It is not your symbolism. Maybe it's the imagery for the client. And when you tell the client, well, I'm seeing a rose with three wilted petals in the second ring. Then they will feel like, oh yeah, this is this and this trauma of how this person betrayed me and la 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 la. It can resonate with them, even though you don't know what it is about. So the imagery can be meant for you, it can be universal or rather collective human um, uh, collectively human imagery, or it can be very specific to the person you're working with. And it is also possible that it is a very cultural image connected to either your bloodline or your client's bloodline. So the imagery you get is, needs some interpretation and knowing about different cultures and also the background of your own bloodline and your client's bloodline can help you to interpret those images. Also images are in a way wanting to reveal themselves to you. Every Energy wants to manifest itself. It is natural for it. So the energy wants to come into you, wants to go to you. And you can use that. You can ask questions like, okay, I'm trying to connect better to you. I'm trying to have more understanding to you. Can you perhaps tell me or show me or demonstrate what it is that you want to do and what you want to happen? then often the image can start to change. It can become more of an animated animation. And this animation can often give you a lot more information than a purely static image. So I hope that this will help to create better visualizations, both of yourself and of others. Good luck.